Okay, I think we are good to go. So, welcome uh, to G5 Israel's webinar on commercial and scientific opportunities in plant-based protein. My name is Neil Goldstein. I'm the managing director here at G5 Israel. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, these are challenging times, and first and foremost, I, I hope that you're all safe and healthy, you and your families. We will begin with a few technical issues. First of all, the event is about, uh, going to last about one hour until six, but we have some extra time to allow for uh, Q&A if this will last. Um, if you do have questions, please put them uh, through the Q&A button here at the bottom. Uh, you can submit questions during the whole event. We are recording this event, so we will share it with you later on, and we will also share with you uh, all of the slides from David's presentation and ours, so no worries about that. Um, so this is what the agenda for today looks like. We're going to do a brief introduction by myself and our partners. David's presentation is going to be the most of today's event, Q&A, and a bit of resources. Um, so what is G5? What is G5 Israel? All around the globe, we're a nonprofit that is working to promote alternative protein. We are using the power of food innovation and also the markets in order to accelerate plant-based and also cultivated meat, dairy, eggs, fish, etc. basically every type of food that, it, that is coming from animals. We believe that this is extremely important in order to create a more sustainable, healthy, and just food system. We are doing it with three main work streams. The first is science and technology. We are working with scientific researchers all around the world, with universities, research uh, centers, also here in Israel, in order to support them on the scientific side of things. We have vast uh, resources for them. Also today, we are announcing an investment of about $4 million in open access research that will be added to the investment we made in 2019. You can see all of this research online on our website as well as many more other resources. Regarding corporate engagement, we're working with companies, the biggest food and agri-tech and pharma companies all around the world to assist them in uh, R&D and uh, the path to market in alternative protein. We are working with investors. We just finished an investor webinar uh, an hour ago in order to educate them about the opportunities in this field and connect them with the uh, ecosystem. And of course, with entrepreneurs, if you are an entrepreneur, feel free to reach out to us. We have, again, a lot of uh, materials for you and we would like to assist you. Regarding policy, we are working with governments all around the world, really, um, in order both to accelerate and promote governmental funding for alternative protein, but also on the regulatory side of things in order to uh, assure that alternative protein have a secured path to market. We are doing it uh, we are based mainly in the U.S., about 70% of our staff in, is in the U.S., but the rest of our are spread really on around the globe. We have people in Brazil, in Europe we have uh, branches in London and in Belgium. In Asia we have branches in mainland China, Hong Kong, India, that's it for now. And here in Israel we are working to bring really the Israel innovation to assist this really um, global effort to support alternative protein. You can see here at the bottom that we have a seal of uh, transparency, uh, which means that G5 is an extremely impactful nonprofit. All of our services are without a charge, and we are doing everything we do in order to promote authentic protein. And now it is my honor to introduce you to Shmuel from Startup Nation. What's up, Shmuel? Hi, Nir. Thanks. And hi, everyone. Uh, privileged to be with you today and um, happy to be alongside these partners. Um, as Nair mentioned, I am Shmuel. I am the agri-food tech sector analyst at Startup Nation Central. Um, SNC, Startup Nation Central, is a nonprofit, completely non-revenue organization. We're non-governmental, uh, completely philanthropic. And our work is essentially promoting uh, folks like you, the innovators in Israel, that are uh, developing new technologies across all kinds of sectors and bring that out into global markets. 
So to do that, we do a variety of things that I won't list all, uh, all of today. Um, but just as an example, a uh, couple of things. First of all, we have this, um, this online search platform called Finder that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, even those that aren't familiar with it, you, if you have a company in Israel that is developing its own technology, you are probably listed on that platform. It's completely free to use, uh, completely free to be a part of. And there we track what's going on with um, Israel's innovators. Nir, if you could move to the next slide, I'll give you an example of uh, what this information gives us. So here, for example, is investment data on Israel's alternative protein scene um, by keeping track of what's going on with the innovators, including uh, investments that they're raising. Uh, we can tell that this subsector of Israel's agri-food innovation has really been taking off in the last couple of years in particular, quite staying at pace with the global phenomenon. And it, and it enables us to actually compare what's going on in Israel to the rest of the world. And so we actually know that um, Israel is a major hub for this kind of innovation, one of the leaders, which I'm sure David will, uh, will mention when he speaks. Um, in addition to the Finder platform, we work directly with uh, large multinational companies. We bring them to Israel to meet startups that we handpick that we think could be excellent partners for them. Um, though not while there's a worldwide pandemic. We find other ways of uh, connecting with them. So that's just a sample of the stuff that we're up to and the services that we offer for the innovators in Israel. I encourage startups, uh, people that are part of the innovation scene in agri-food in Israel to be in touch with me in this time. We are looking for ways to understand, first of all, what's going on with you all and to help ease the, uh, the hardships that, um, that startups in particular are experiencing. Uh, so that's it for me. I'll pass, thing, pass it over to our partner, Dana Kedar at uh, Growing IL. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Dana Kedar and I'm the community manager of Growing IL. Growing Ale is a nonprofit joint venture of the Israel Innovation Institute, Startup Nation Central, Ministry of Economy, and the Ministry of Social Equity. And our aim is to develop the Israeli EgTech ecosystem by creating events, tools, and opportunities which answers unmet needs of the ecosystem. Um, before we start with the webinar, I just wanted to say that I know that all of us are, are going through a hard reality now with the spreading of coronavirus. Um, and I just wanted to stress the fact that we are here for you. Um, feel free to reach out and we'll try to assist in every way that we can. Um, so without further ado, let's begin with the webinar. Passing the mic back to Nir and enjoy. Bye. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Shmuel. Both of you, we really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with both Growing IL and the Israeli Innovation Institute and Startup Nation Central. So thanks again. And now I want to present our main speaker for today, Dr. David Welsh. Uh, David has a PhD in plant developmental cell biology. He has a vast experience in the life science industry, where he held various positions in both business development, marketing, and product management. David, luckily for us, joined GFI in 2017. And now he is the director of science and technology, where he oversees our really great team of scientist at G5. So David, thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nir. And it's uh, really wonderful to see so many people uh, joining for this. I'm so glad that we were able to get together despite uh, recent events and do this, do this online. Uh, so today I'd like to uh, talk to you specifically about the alternative protein revolution and how it applies to the agritech space, focusing on, um, on the use of plants in this, in this area. And, um, you know, following on from what Nir said, um, GFI really exists to accelerate this alternative protein industry forward as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And one of the ways that we do this is by identifying and, and addressing the most critical white space opportunities in the alternative protein sector. And we use that information to direct our research grant funding that, that Nir mentioned. And we, I, I encourage you to head over to our website to explore um, the grant recipients in more detail. I, I'll touch on them today. Um, we also use this information to provide advice to organizations from companies, investors, and governments about where to direct their, their 
funds and, and energy in research. Um, we produce case studies and, um, and white papers. And ultimately, we want to use this information to direct uh, the research in dedicated research centers focused on innovating in alternative proteins. And one of the questions that drives our work as we're thinking about these critical white space areas is how will we feed the 9.7 or 10 billion people that will live on this planet by 2050? And one interesting way to think about that is by looking at the Earth's surface and the amount of land that we have to grow food for human consumption. So if, when we look at the Earth, about 30% of it is comprised of land. And of that 30%, about 70% is habitable land, the remainder being glaciers and, and barren land that we can't live on or, or grow things on. Of that 70%, we currently use half of it for agriculture. The remainder is made up of forests, shrublands, and urban areas that we live in. And I, I think you would all agree that we don't want to deplete more of our forests and shrublands than we already have. So we're currently working with that 50% um, of land that we use for, for agriculture. And we, when we look at how we currently use that, that land, over three quarters of it is used for livestock production. That includes both land that we use to grow the animals and also the crops that we feed the animals. Whereas just a quarter is used to grow crops that are used for human consumption. But what's really interesting is when you look at the, um, how much of our global protein supply each of those two segments produce, it's almost reversed. So that three quarters of the land we use for agricultural um, production is or livestock production m provides just 33% of our protein supply from meat and dairy, whereas that 23% we use for crop crop growth um, provides two thirds of our uh, protein supply through plant-based foods. So what's the reason for that that dichotomy? Much of it is related to the inbuilt inefficiencies of, of animals. If we look at the chicken, for example, it takes nine calories of energy in to produce just one calorie of food that we can eat, just an 11% conversion rate. And that's because chickens, just like every other animal, including you and me, need energy to move around, to think and breathe. And other animals we use for food are, are significantly worse uh, than the chicken. And that's just one way that um, our industrial animal agriculture system is causing uh, problems on the planet today. Another critical area is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, today, um, antimicrobial resistance or superbugs causes around 700,000 deaths um, annually. But if left unchecked, projections show that uh, it's likely to cause up to 10 million um, annual deaths by 2050, costing the world in the region of 100 trillion dollars in, in, in global health issues. This is more than all cancers um, combined today. Another area that I think you're probably all aware of is livestock emissions. Uh, livestock emissions account for about 14% of all emissions. That's more than the tra transport sector. But when we look at the emissions from the top 20 meat and dairy companies combined, they actually emit more greenhouse gases than some of the, the biggest industrial uh, countries in the world, such as Germany, Canada, Australia, the UK, and France. And then finally, market disrupting events linked to animal agriculture can have an enormous financial impact. A, a really good example of that are the uh, events connected to swine flu that impacted uh, China's uh, agricultural industry over the, over the past couple of years. There were hundreds of outbreaks of swine flu in China since 2018, and which caused over about half of Chinese, uh, China's breeding pigs to, to either die or, or be culled. So that's over 1.5 million uh, pigs. And you can see from the graph on the left that the, the reduction, rapid reduction in the number of pigs available to supply food to this to the industry caused a, a massive increase in the price of um, pigs and pork, which is still present today. Fortunately, we have uh, a far more sustainable source of, of uh, proteins from plants. All of the, the plants, whether they come from up 
sorry, all of the proteins, whether they come from legumes or roots or staple crops like wheat and rice, uh, use less land to be grown, require less water, and emit fewer greenhouse gas emissions than their animal-based counterparts. So we have a great supply of proteins, and we're starting to see these used more and more to create analogs of conventional animal meat, egg, and dairy products. And this isn't just a fad. We're seeing a rapid uh, growth in these and uh, signifying a trend. So this, this graph here shows um, new product launches with a vegan claim global by, by region through to 2017. And this growth is continuing as well. And you can see this hockey stick effect, but where each year more and more products um, using plants uh, are being launched onto the market. And this is resulting in a pretty um, optimistic uh, viewpoint in terms of where this market is going to go. On this slide, we've aggregated various analyst projections on the plant-based meat market that um, estimate growth and market share 10 to 15 years out. And while you can see a pretty broad range of estimates, the consensus seems to be that plant-based meat will have about a 10% share of the total meat market. 10% in the US in those uh, two examples above, and then but globally as well, around about a 10% market share. There's obviously a lot of variance here with UBS being more conservative, estimating a 6% share by 2030, and AT Kearney being quite a bit more bullish, projecting a 23% market share by 2035. But all of this, I think, shows you that we're expecting this growth that we've seen over the past couple of years to continue for years to come. And much of this is driven not by the vegan and vegetarian consumers of the world, which remain at about 6% of the total population, but really by omnivores and flexitarians that are becoming more aware of these issues and challenges that the uh, conventional animal agriculture industry is causing and trying to be more conscious about their food choices, picking more sustainable options, but still wanting to enjoy the tastes and other sensory characteristics of meat, egg, and dairy products that they like so much. A final way to look at this market and think about how, how much it's likely to grow in the coming years is to use plant-based milk as an analogy. About a little bit over 10 years ago, plant-based milk occupy just a small uh, percent of the total milk market, around 1% to 2%. Similar to what we see today for plant-based meat, this graph here showing um, the share in the retail market in the US, where um, plant-based meat has about a 2% market share. But if we look at the growth that we've seen in the past 10 years for plant-based milk, which now commands a 14% market share, we can make some estimations about where we expect plant-based meat to go. And just in the US retail sector alone, this ends up being a $12 billion opportunity. So I think looking at this slide and the previous one showing the, the, uh, the growth rate over the past couple of years, the analyst projections, I think we can agree that this is a, a sector that is not going away. It's gonna to continue to grow and grow. And how do we do that? Um, what I'd like to do now is take a look through the alternative protein landscape and look at some of the innovations that are helping um, this industry accelerate as fast as it can and move towards a more significant market share. And as I step through these, the technology in this space, I'd like you to reflect on these questions that were submitted to us by uh, people in attendance on the, on the webinar today. So what barriers could prevent alternative proteins from becoming a dominant protein source? What are the key gaps in the Israeli alternative protein ecosystem? How can the government help this field accelerate? How should the industry prioritize which proteins to develop? And then finally, how can GFI help you help, help advance the Israeli alternative protein ecosystem? So when we look at the alternative protein space, we categorize it into three technology areas from a production cost and infrastructure perspective. Plant, uh, proteins from plants, proteins using microbial fermentation, and then using animal cell culture, so-called cultured meat or cultivated meat to produce uh, actual meat. 
Today, I'm going to focus on, on plant proteins, but I'll, I'll also bring in microbial fermentation as an enabling technology to allow even better plant-based meat products. And ultimately, what we see happening in the future is this uh, spectrum of animal product alternatives from fully plant-based products on the left to fully cultivated or synthetic products on the right, but really um, a bulk of the industry um, using these hybrid products, which would take the best ingredients from all of these technology sectors and combining them together in, in ways to create the best, best products possible. But when we think about plants and plant-based meat, really what we're trying to do is take some kind of crop and turn it into, in the case of plant-based meat, a texturized product that meets the taste and other sensory characteristics that consumers are looking for. And it's not just a straight line, as we'll talk more about in the, in the coming slides. It's really a, a black box of different parameters that one can adjust and optimize to create that textured product. So what I'd like to do now is walk through the, the process of creating plant-based meat and then focus in on some of the most interesting areas for um, innovation and technology development. So plant-based meat um, follows a pretty straightforward process. We need to identify the best source material, thinking about what type of product we're making at the end. So this could be a traditional staple crop like soy or pea, or identifying a novel, novel crop like lupin or fava bean that could be used instead. We're then optimizing that crop so that it, it grows well for plant-based meat applications, and that could be through breeding technologies or by applying modern gene editing technologies like CRISPR. Once we've done that, we're growing the crop and then we're isolating and functionalizing the raw materials so that we're creating a, a bigger, more functional toolbox for food developers to use. And those could be mechanical methods or chemical or enzymatic methods to isolate those raw materials and, and optimize them so that they work better in the end product composition and optimization phase. And this is really where food chemists, food scientists are combining all of those new ingredients together in novel ways to create um, products that biomimic um, animal, meat, egg and dairy products. And when we did our uh, most recent white space um, project, we identified four themes that I'll walk through today. Um, relative to the plant-based meat, egg, and dairy sector. One is around crop optimization. The second is around identifying alternative production methods to create these textured um, proteins for plant-based meat. Expanding manufacturing capacity is critical so that we can continue to grow as rapidly as the sector has seen. And then finally, a fairly obvious one, improving the sensory um, attributes of these products so they taste even better than the ones that exist today. And when we look at this entire value chain, um, there's literally hundreds of ideas that we could come up with from all the way from the beginning of uh, characterizing and optimizing the crops through to the final stages of um, delivering these products to food service and, and retail operators. But I won't talk about all of these areas today. I'll, I'd really like to focus for this audience on these four areas. So crop optimization and characterization, raw material optimization, different production methods, and then finally, uh, improvements and innovations in product development, so novel flavors and colors and textures that can make these products even better. And in these four categories, we identified a number of different really interesting ideas. I won't um, talk through all of these today, uh, but I will speak through, through some of them in more detail and some of the research projects that GFI is funding to identify um, solutions to some of these, these challenging areas like novel methods to breed crops for plant-based meat applications, uh, valorizing the whole plant so that we can bring costs down, alternatives to technologies like high moisture extrusion to texturize the proteins, and looking at novel ways of incorporating fats and, and other flavors into um, plant-based meat products at the end. Let's first take a look at crop characterization and optimization. And this really is about identifying either new crops or modifying the crops that we currently use, such as soy, wheat, and pea, 
so that they become better for plant-based meat applications. And we can use, as I mentioned before, traditional breeding or gene editing technologies to improve the nutrition, the functionality, and the growth performance of these crops while reducing cost. A really nice example of how this has been done in other sectors of the food industry is in the, in the bread space. So what researchers are doing now um, is mapping all of the functional and uh, quality, yield, and disease-resistant attributes onto uh, the genome of wheat. So they can, they can then start to selectively breed or engineer varieties of wheat that provide not only good growth and disease resistance characteristics, but pro provide um, better functional characteristics, such as the amount of protein inside wheat, or the color, the mixing time, so that all, all of these um, attributes of bread um, can be um, improved. And we can apply the same type of methodology to um, improving crops for plant-based meat applications as well. And we're starting to see some really interesting research in this area as well. And I'll step through these pretty quickly, but um, I'd encourage you to go to our website to learn more about these. At, at Clemson University, Dr. Thavaraja is, is optimizing uh, pea and sorghum for plant-based meat applications. Here in Israel, uh, Ophir Benjamin at Tel High College is working with quinoa um, to create proteins, protein isolates and concentrates from quinoa for use in plant-based meat applications. And um, since his work began last year, he's already created a quinoa protein concentrate and is now working on, a, on an isolate, which is super exciting. Uh, a company in the U.S., Trophic, is is working with with seaweed and trying to identify the best seaweed varieties and optimize um, extraction and isolation methods to use seaweed as a functional protein in plant-based meat applications. And then finally, on this slide, um, a group at Embrapa in Brazil is working on methods to use cashew as a raw material for for plant-based meat applications. In addition to these um, individual research projects, we're starting to see, to see research consortiums form as well to optimize crops for plant-based meat applications. In Europe, the Smart Protein Project, of which GFI is a partner, but also Equinom, um, a company I think you're all familiar with, is working to optimize quinoa, fava bean, lentil, and chickpea for a variety of plant-based food applications. In India, GFI is partnering with Icrisat to optimize millet to create high-protein snacks and plant-based meat um, products. And then here in the U.S., um, Crops of the Future, an initiative from the Food Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, is working to, uh, to optimize new or underutilized crops specifically for plant-based food applications as well. So there's a lot of work starting to happen, but still a lot of white space opportunities as well to improve crops or identify new crops. Once we've got the crops, then we need to optimize them uh, or optimize the raw materials from them and identify better ways to extract the important raw materials from those crops. Today, we currently rely on soy uh, for the, most of the plant-based meat products that are on the market and then to a lesser extent, tea and wheat. So uh, how do we identify either more crops or optimize those existing crops in a better way? When we look at soy, pea, and wheat, the primary products from those are not actually products that are used by the, the plant-based meat industry. In the case of soy, the primary product is soybean oil. In the case of pea, for example, it's pea starch. And the and the byproduct that we use in this industry is, is protein. So we can either um, optimize these crops so that the protein product is the primary one, or we can identify new crops as I talked about in the previous sector, or we can identify better processes to work with these crops or other crops to make the protein um, raw materials from these more functional for plant-based meat applications. And this is some of the research that we're funding in this area as well. 
One really interesting area is around site stream utilization. And a group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands is looking at a wide variety of proteins from agricultural site streams to identify those that provide them the best functional and organoleptic advantages, as well as developing technology platforms to um, extract these in, in a more efficient way. Another project in Brazil is to um, work with the leaves from cassava, uh, cassava plants um, to create protein raw materials for plant-based meat. And I think this is a really exciting area of uh, trying to use a plant that's used for other purposes and see how we can valorize the leaves which are underutilized today. And this research should translate over to other plants as well where the leaves are not currently used uh, for food production. We're seeing interesting work using fermentation to improve the, um, the raw materials that are used for plant-based meat applications. In Australia, a group there is looking at using uh, high pressure processing uh, technologies that have been used in other areas of the food industry and, and figuring out how that they, they can be applied to proteins for plant-based meat applications. Another project in Brazil is looking at um, obtaining protein concentrates and isolates from beans and developing methods to do that more efficiently. And then finally, another project in the Netherlands is, is developing improved fractionation methods to create better raw materials for plant-based meat applications. So we, we've optimized the crops, we've optimized the raw materials. Now, what are the production methods that we can use to create better textures, better sensory um, inputs for these plant-based meat products? One of the primary drivers of this plant-based meat sector is to reorganize these globular plant proteins so that they become more like animal proteins, so that they're stretched out and fibrillar, like the proteins that are found in meat and crosslinked together. The technology we rely on today for the most part is mechanical, the high moisture extruder, which works very well, but is um, fairly expensive to um, buy and incorporate into a manufacturing facility and is not the most sustainable system in the world, requiring high amounts of energy and water to, to run. There are other mechanical and enzymatic um, technologies that we can explore, and researchers are starting to, uh, to look at these in more detail. One interesting example of this is a shear cell technology, which, which was developed at Bargaining University, which uses rotational forces to restructure those plant proteins and create a, a fibrous plant-based meat product. Another really interesting area is the application of extrusion-based bioprinting or 3D printing to create flexible and tunable structured meat products from a wide variety of ingredients. And there's a couple of really interesting startups. One of them based in Israel, Redefine Meat, is doing really, really interesting things in, the, in this area. And again, through our own research funding, we're, we're seeing some exciting work happening in this space. A lot of groups looking at how we can improve and make high moisture extrusion more efficient. Two really interesting groups um, in Canada are looking at optimizing the uh, extrusion process and also creating um, systems and sensors to monitor the extrusion process so we can better understand what is happening during the process and adjust parameters so that we get a better product out at the end. In the University of Minnesota, um, a group there is looking at how do we, um, which pulse proteins and which parameters on an extrusion system uh, work best for particular types of plant-based meat products. And what's going to come out of this, this project, which I think is really exciting, is a data set that will help us um, begin to understand how the raw material, the way it's processed, and the extrusion conditions all interact to affect the ultimate sensory characteristics of the final product. Also in the US, uh, there's a really interesting project at Washington State University to explore the role of fava bean protein and lentil protein and dietary fibers. How can we combine those together to create better 
um, better inputs for the extrusion process to create a better texturized product. And then finally, going back to the shear cell technology that I mentioned um, a couple of slides back, uh, Birgit Decker is at a startup in the Netherlands, Rival Foods, is taking that shear cell technology from a scientific tool to a commercially viable uh, production uh, machine. So we're really hopeful that um, our funding of that project uh, will start to see the, um, the spread of that more sustainable shear force technology um, for plant-based protein texturization in the future. And that finally leads us to the, the, this final category of product development. So how can we bring all of these things together to assemble um, the right ingredients in the right way to create products that consumers are going to want to eat? A great example of innovation we've seen in this area already is um, Impossible Foods and their identification of heme as a key component of beef that provides the, the taste consumers associate with, with beef. They isolated that um, from soy, soy like hemoglobin, now express it in yeast through recombinant protein technology to provide a key part of the flavor and appearance of the Impossible Burger. And we can also use um, enzymes and other proteins like this to create better textures as well. What this slide shows an example of is using uh, specific en enzymes to cross-link soy proteins to create either a harder or soft, softer texture in a, in a final product. And I expect we'll see more and more um, innovations and, and R&D in this, this space of creating novel proteins and novel enzymes to adjust the texture or improve the flavor of these, these final products. And, and here again, GFI is funding some pretty exciting research in this, in this area. In the case of uh, plant-based fats, uh, Ricardo San Martin at UC Berkeley is exploring the use of oleogels uh, as a better uh, type of, of fat to create that organoleptic experience um, that fat provides in, in all kinds of meat products. At the University of, of Massachusetts, Julie McClements is, is working on an innovative approach that doesn't rely on extrusion for creating fiber-like structures from plant proteins and that can be used for meat substitutes. We also need flavor improve, improvements and Professor Jan Li at, at Beijing University is working to identify the, um, the components, the volatile compounds in pea and other legumes that produce the off flavors so that we can pr improve our understanding of these flavor compounds and hopefully remove those um, from the, the raw materials. And then finally, um, Ben Goldberg um, here in, in Israel is exploring um, fermentation to develop new meat flavors from plant ingredients that can be added to food products to give organoleptically satisfying nutritional um, flavor bases that can be used to improve the flavor of meat analogs, a really important area um, that will allow us to, um, as an industry, get closer and closer to perfecting the, the flavor of these, these, these plant-based meat products. So I've, I've given you a lot of um, insight into the, the research that's going on around the world to um, improve this entire industry. And through our white space work, we identified a number of kind of critical um, white space areas that I wanted to uh, highlight briefly and then focus on one just to give you an example of how the fermentation, um, fermentation technology is being applied to plant-based, to the plant-based meat industry to create even uh, better products. So the white space ideas that we, we uh, identified as top priority areas um, in our recent work, there were two on the commercial side and two on the R&D side. On the commercial side, there's a clear need for end-to-end -end product development and co-manufacturers. So thinking about all the way from isolating those raw materials from the crops that I mentioned before, through to uh, scale up and final manufacturing of the, of the end product. There's a huge need for co-manufacturers to assist both startups and existing corporations with all of the um, all of those technologies that exist, and I think we're starting to see some 
some of those types of um, facilities um, spring up in Israel as well, which is really exciting. On the end product side, there's a big, big need for better plant-based seafood products. Plant-based seafood occupies just about 1% of the overall plant-based meat market, and there's considerable opportunities to create more and better uh, plant-based seafood products. On the crop optimization side, um, a lot of interesting work, I think, is starting to happen, but there's a significant white space to apply bioinformatics to identify the, the best proteins to experiment with for uh, to provide the, the right functional properties in, in plant-based meat products. And then if we think beyond plant-based meat into the area of, of cheese, um, there's significant white space to create better cheese products from plants that have that meltability and, and, and stretch of cheese. And that's where I'd like to um, spend the next couple of minutes is talking about um, cheese and how we can innovate in the, in the area of alternative cheese. So when we think about um, how cheese is made, there's, there's three stages of, of this process. In the first stage, the enzyme rennet cuts off these, um, a specific fragment of one of the casins, this kappa um, casein, which if you can see in this um, top, right, top left image here, little hairs stick out of these kappa caseins and rennet um, cleaves those off, which then permits the aggregation of these uh, micelles that, he, that the caseins reside in, in, in dairy, in, in milk, um, to aggregate together. And that's where that uh, second stage starts to happen, where you have this physical process of aggregation of these um, disrupted casein particles that then form a gel. Um, that, and that's the, the really beginning formations of cheese. And then depending on the type of cheese that's being made, um, different uh, temperatures or storage lengths are applied to create different types of cheeses. But right now, all of the plant-based cheeses that exist on the market don't use this, this, this science to create the meltability and stretchability of cheese. So I think there's some really interesting white space opportunities here to think about how we can structure plant proteins to form these micelles. So are there, like I spoke about before with the use of enzymes, are there novel enzymes that we can identify that will restructure plant proteins to allow them to form these micelles and aggregates to create and, and then interact with the, the fats present in, in cheese to create that, that stretchability and meltability. But another way that we can do this is through the use of fermentation or uh, recombinant protein technology. And there's a, a few interesting um, startups that have formed in, in recent years that are, are doing just that. So Perfect Day in the US, New Culture also in the US, and then Legendary in, in Europe are um, using um, recombinant proteins from, from dairy, but expressing those through microorganisms such as yeast to produce uh, large volumes of these. And uh, last year, as a prototype launch, Perfect Day um, produced an ice cream with these um, with these recombinant dairy proteins, which I was fortunate enough to try. It tasted like ice cream, pretty good. And I think it's it's just a matter of time before um, these companies start to produce uh, to um, use these proteins to create um, cheese products that are more similar to conventional cheese. So there's opportunities to use both plant proteins and these recombinant dairy proteins to create um, novel cheese products. And ultimately, this is just one example of how fermentation is going to be useful along this entire uh, spectrum of alternative product, protein products that I mentioned before. So we can use enzymes, as I talked about before, to restructure plant proteins to create uh, better texture or better functional properties. We can use fermentation to produce flavoring ingredients, such as the soy lake hemoglobin used in the Impossible Burger. We can even use fermentation to um, produce growth factors to for cultivated meat, which I didn't speak about today, but is going to be um, a critical part of this until entire alternative protein industry. And then we can even, even use fermentation to produce 100% fermentation-derived ingredients, such as, such as synthetic gelatin or the recombinant dairy and egg proteins I mentioned before. So hopefully what I showed you today is a little bit of insight into these, these different black boxes that um, 
would take us from taking a crop of some kind, optimizing that crop so that it grows more efficiently and has the right functional attributes for the end product we're trying to make, namely plant-based meat, egg, or dairy products. The different methods we can use to optimize those raw materials from the crop. And then how, and then different methods and technologies we can use to assemble those raw materials in the right way to get a better taste, a better sensory uh, characteristics, and at the same time bring down the price. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this thought that um, it's not only about making, growing these crops to produce um, a plant based meat, egg, or dairy product but thinking about how we can use every single part of the plant or the microorganism to create this new feed industry. In a similar way to the current animal agriculture industry uses every part of the animal um, when producing meat. So we can take crops or bacteria or yeast and use those as inputs into these alternative um, meat products, or we can use side stream biomass uh, as an input as well not only to, to produce these high molecular weight proteins for these products, but also as inputs into other parts of this uh, industry. For example, the amino acids can be used for, um, in, in the cell culture media for cultivated meat. We can use the simple sugars as, as feedstock for microbial fermentation, or even to create scaffolds for cultivated meat technology. So there's really a lot of opportunities, not only to create better plant-based meat products, but to create this circular bioeconomy that's gonna en enable this industry to move forward uh, much more quickly and be more efficient at the same time. And if you'd like to learn more, more about any of what I spoke about today, I'd, I'd suggest that you head to our, our resources page and you, there you can filter on your particular areas of interest, whether that be plant-based meat or cultivated meat, and learn even more about uh, what I spoke about today. And with that, I'll stop there and, and open the uh, floor for questions. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we have so many questions, which means either you were very interesting or people didn't get what you were saying. Uh, I hope it was the first one. Let's see. Um, so the first question is about the coronavirus. How do you think this will affect both um, animal uh, production and alternative protein production? Yeah, I think it's in one sense, it's a little early to tell um, because it's there's so much uncertainty and confusion right now, but certainly it looks like there's a, a big shift away from um, eating out, which is um, right now already affecting the restaurant industry. And at least from the initial analyses that I've seen and read, um, it's likely that it will take, um, even after the coronavirus um, dies down, um, it's going to take that sector a long time to um, recover. And so I think there's, there's going to be a longer lasting trend of people um, taking out food or, or eating at home. And there's a lot of advantages um, of, of plant-based um, foods for this, right? They're, they can be more shelf stable. There's less of these market um, impact from other types of market disrupting events that can shift the price and supply. So I, I, I'm quite um, optimistic that we'll see some long-term shifts in, um, in the adoption of more and more plant-based foods as a result of this. Yeah, I agree. Um... To all of you that are writing questions in the chat, please submit them through the Q&A button here at the bottom so that it is uh, just a bit easier for us. We have a question from Adi uh, regarding hybrid products, or uh, maybe you can also say blended products of both uh, animal-based and, um, and, and plant-based protein. Uh, what, is, what do you think of, of this segment? Yeah, I think we've seen, um... We're seeing some interesting um, uh, research in this area. Um, so for example, um, Tyson Foods um, launched some um, blended products like this last year, which I, I think have done pretty well um, in the US. And while not um, vegan, um, even by just um, you know cutting the amount of animal meat used in these products by half, you're um, having a, a really positive impact on the on the uh, uh, on the planet, um, both from an environmental perspective and a, and a um, welfare perspective as well. Um, so that's 
and I think we'll see that um, continuing to to grow as well that that sector. And then, as I mentioned in my presentation, there's a lot of opportunities to to create blended products from different alternative protein technologies as well. And I think that's a a really um, uh, that that's going to be a, a big trend in the future where products like the Impossible Burger, which are utilizing um, you know fermentation and plant-based um, products, will continue to grow and grow. Yeah, sometimes people use hybrid both for uh, combinations of authentic protein such as cultivated meat and plant-based protein, for sure. We are getting a lot of questions regarding regulation, the, the fun subject of regulation, obviously about uh, gene editing, GMO. Uh, what do you think? Are there territories that are going to change their approach in the long run? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I personally hope so. I think that there's um, a lot of promise to um, some of these modern uh, gene editing technologies that they are far more specific than um, the, the methods that were used in the past. I think there's a lot of um, stigma associated with um, conventional uh, GM technologies, which um, I hope um, can change in the coming years because there's um, as with any technology, it can be used for both good and bad purposes. And I think um, it would be a shame if we were not to allow uh, the exploration of some of these, these really promising technologies like, like CRISPR. Um, but there are also ways to do what I spoke about in my presentation through um, conventional um, breeding methods or speed breeding. And um, there's really exciting um, uh, innovations happening in Israel. I, I mentioned Equinom, um, who is doing super exciting things with with pea and other crops through uh, through breeding and not relying on on gene editing. And there's a um, number of other um, really exciting companies as well. In fact, we're um, later, I think either later this week or the beginning of next week, we're getting together as a as a group to talk about um, some of the opportunities, specifically in Israel, for um, for crop optimization. Mm -hmm. Many more events coming this following uh, week. We'll cover them late, later. Um, we have an interesting question from Jonathan Berger. Hi, Jonathan. Regarding the target price and target percentage of protein for raw material to be relevant for plant-based meat. Yeah, this is a really great question. And I, I um, thank you, Jonathan. And I wish I could give you like an exact answer, right? That it needs to be like $1.20 um, a kilo. Um, it, it depends somewhat on the on each of the products and the amount of um, protein and, and other ingredients that are used to assemble that final product. Because in the end, it's not just the plant protein. It's, it, it, um, depending on the product, it will rely, it will need some fats and other flavors and you know, maybe some of these more um, high-tech um, ingredients like the soy lake hemoglobin I mentioned. But what I, I can tell you is that when we've analyzed the price of um, some of the staple, uh, the proteins from staple crops like soy and wheat and pea, um, and, and it, it doesn't seem like that is a, um, a barrier to um, bringing the cost of these products down in, in, the, in the long term. Some of the um, more novel crops that are being um, explored today, like fava bean and quinoa and, and lupin, are obviously uh, higher priced, but um, soy in particular is, has a, is a pretty uh, competitive price. And um, I think it's really just about, uh, one, about market demand. So a lot of these products are priced for the more affluent consumer right now, but we're starting to see the price of of many of these products drop. In, in fact, um, Impossible Foods uh, a couple of weeks ago announced a significant uh, decrease in the price of, of their products. Um, and, and so I think all of this points to ingredients, um, at least these sort of commodity ingredients, not being the, the primary barrier to um, price reduction. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic that this will happen over time. And as these more novel crops get scaled up, that the price of those will come down as well. We have another interesting question from Jim, uh, who is asking in the context of a five to 10 times increase in demand, which of those technologies that you mentioned, again, plant-based fermentation or cultivated meat is most likely to get to scale in about five to 10 years? 
Yeah, thank you, Jim. I'm um, I, from what we're seeing today. I'm um, more optimistic about um, the use of fermentation um, technology to uh, achieve that five to ten um, increase in demand. I think it's it's inherently a more um, scalable technology, particularly when um, working with um, either existing or, or novel strains. Um, the for the most part, the technology that's used to um, produce large amounts of, of microbes for uh, either biomass or individual proteins is well understood, and the infrastructure exists to scale it up. Um, but I think we'll see both of these grow together. As I as I mentioned in my presentation, I'm uh, pretty optimistic about um, there being many more of these hybrid technologies that use ingredients from fermentation. Um, and ingredients from from plants, um, but I, I expect that um, overall uh, fermentation is going to see the um, enable the um, more rapid growth over the coming years. We have a question from Daniel asking regarding uh, extrusion extrusion labs that people can use for R and D instead of just buying you know, a whole extruder. Um, so obviously we have some resources online for people that we can share with them. Uh, opportunities in Israel right now are a bit limited, but uh, there is more to come in the near future. Uh, you can expect that. And you can also contact uh, JFI Israel if you want to get connections in Europe for that. Um, David, do you have anything to add on extrusion R&D facilities? Yeah, I would um, point you to our uh, resources. There's, um, we have a plant-based meat manufacturing um, document that um, I'm sure we'll share after the, the presentation. And in that, there is a directory of um, co-manufacturers and, and food kitchens that have um, uh, that provide access to extruders. And we're starting to see more and more of these um, open up around the world as well as demand for. Um, Access to extruders without, you know, without having to spend a million dollars yourself on a on a industrial size extruder. We are getting questions about funding for PhD students uh, that are super excited about recombinant protein specifically. Uh, what do you think? Can we help? Yeah, I mean, um, our. As, as Nir mentioned in, in the beginning of the talk, we just announced our, our second round of um, funding for uh, work in this, this area. And our, and our research funds, not just um, plant-based meat research, but all of those technology areas I, I spoke about. And our plan is to grow this um, every year um, and, and find uh, more um, amazing donors to, um, to fund the research that we, that we fund. Um, but we also we are also actively um, trying to identify grants from funding bodies around the world um, to allow you know, PhD students and postdocs to do research in this area. So I would um, point you to our research grants um, uh, webpage gfi.org forward slash research grants, which has um, uh, which will soon have a funding database um, that you can access to identify. Um, opportunities to fund PhD projects or postdoc projects. Um, in addition, we often highlight um, new PhD and, and postdoc opportunities that, are, um, that, are, that have come up at universities around the world. So, so um, yeah, the best place to go is our website for all of that. Okay, uh, we are reaching the hour now. So what we will do is, um, I think we will present shortly the staff and few more uh, interesting things and then we can get back to David uh, with a few more questions. Um, so this is G5 Israel's team, myself or Benjamin, our Director of Operations, Dr. Tom Benaria, our Senior Scientist, Daskar Shai, Marketing Manager, and the wonderful Lior Schneidman, our Executive Assistant. We are also hiring here in Israel, so if you would like to join the Alternative Protein Revolution or you know someone who might be good at those positions, please refer them to us. We have an opening at the academic relations manager working with all of the Israeli uh, academic ecosystem. 
We have an opening at the business engagement manager uh, to help us conduct events like this, work with investors, entrepreneurs, big food and other uh, companies. And we have a policy manager opening uh, to work with the Israeli government to assist all of us in accelerating alternative protein. You can reach us on any manner at israel at gfi.org. We also have a Facebook and LinkedIn page, uh, the, the Good Food Israel. Uh, that's what 